teacher, Elder Michael Johnson. Teaching the world the true meaning of Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. So, have your Bible, notepad, and pencil ready as he goes through today's study. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. I want to welcome everyone to King James Bible University. I'm Elder Michael Johnson, and I'm on the the elder of the lost sheep of Israel. We're going to be going through today, we're going to be going through a teaching today, which, as I spoke before, we're going to continue to go through each tribe to see how do they match up these tribes to what the Bible is saying based on Genesis 49, based in that chapter. So we're going to look at the, the, the next part of the scripture today, which we're going to be going through Judah. And we want to find out exactly how do Judah matches up with the um, with what they say, because many people say you know Judah is based on how it's set up and how they actually determine how the American blacks are the children of Judah. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that piece of text. We're going to look at verses eight and nine, and we're going to see. Exactly, do do it match up, or, or what is it saying? Because Jacob, who is Israel, is making a statement to Judah, to where we need to understand what what, what it's saying. So if we find out what he's saying, we can find out what he means. So we're going to look at those scriptures. We're going to look at some pieces in there. We're going to find out exactly what it's saying. So we had the ones who was actually over in uh, the UK, where you actually seeing the part, which. Um, we can turn it over to which you can, which I'm a, I'm a move it over a little bit to where you can see what we're doing on the, on the screen here because the ones who are over on you on our live stream can actually see it. So let me set this up and we're gonna go right through it and we're gonna see exactly what is going on. So now we should be able to see everything what is happening. Now we look in here. And we're going to look at the first one, which is Judah 49 and 8. Which we're going to see in verse 8, it says, Judah, thou art, uh, thou art the whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Now, we need to understand what this is meaning. Because Judah... It means, you know, it meaning that he was going to rule over his brothers, the, the following tribe, but no other nations. Basically what it's saying here, and, and there for your enemies, which will bring the second part of the enemies. So we need to understand what this is saying, because it's saying the brother's going to praise him, his brother's, and then his hand's going to be, his hand's going to be on the neck of his enemies, that father's children should bow before him. So these three things, we need to look deeper in what it's saying here. Because we need to understand exactly what the scripture is, is actually stating to where we can get what, it, what it's talking about. But we're going to find out, is this the tribe that is speaking of, like within, um, or Judah is the ones of the American blacks. Now, one, we do know that, that, that the Israelites are the, black, are the blacks that are over in America. And we have them in other places. But, but they had depicted them in different places. So we want to find out what part of Israel is here and how it's depicting us. This is what we're finding out. And we're going to find out part of this, which is talking about, which in Judah it says, David spake unto the Lord the words of this song, the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of the enemies, out of the hands of Saul. So we know here, when you look up here, you see where he's talking about his neck going to be on thy enemies. Now, we know one of the enemies was Saul. So it's saying, remember when Saul was seeking to kill David, who became his enemy. Now, this is one of the, now this is one of the parts here we have to remember. When we continue to go down, we're going to look at 2 Samuel 22 and 4. 2 Samuel 22 and 4. And we can see where it says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So we see in David is completely dependent upon the Lord for this. So he says, so shall I be saved from my enemies. 
So we see that David is completely relying upon the Lord for this. So when you look at this, you will see that if you continue many times, David had opportunities to kill Saul. Many times, because Saul was asleep, many times he could have came up and he could have actually destroyed Saul, but he didn't. His, 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 his uh, total dependence was upon the Lord. And now we're going to go down to a little bit more. And we're going to pull a little bit more information in 2 Samuel 22 and 7. And it says, In my distress, I will call upon the Lord and cry to my God. He, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Now we know that David, the Most High, he heard God and he heard his voice. So the Most High temple, David is actually speaking of his body because if you go and you look at what Paul speaks, it tells you right there that the temple is your body. And this is what David is actually saying here when you're sitting there talking about when he, when he, when he cried out to the Lord and then out of the Lord, out of his temple. He's talking about his body. He, this is what he's talking about. So we have to understand what David is talking about all the time. But we're going to, but we pull in this to get the foundation to where we can go into exactly what this meaning is. Now down at 2 Samuel 22 and 18, it says, He has delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hate me, for they were too strong for me. Now, David telling you clearly that the Lord will deliver him from his enemies that hate him. David also states that they was too strong for him. But we're going to find out why his father, Israel, said the way he said it. Because when you're looking at here, they, he was saying they was too strong for him. You got to remember, David was a young man when, this, when, when, he, when, he, when he took over. He was only about 30 years old. So when he's sitting there talking about that they, he was delivered, we have to understand that David was a young man and he had enemies that hated him, even started with Saul. Now, here's this verse going to explain exactly what, 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 what it's actually saying all together. 2 Samuel 22, 36, we're going to go down to 39. It says, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy gentleness have made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, so that my feet did not slip. And then he said, I have pursued my enemy. So it's letting you know David has has he he stood up and he fought. This is what it's letting you know. And he said, and destroyed them. So he has stood up and he fought his enemies and he has destroyed them. And he says, and turn not again until I have consumed them, and I have consumed them and wounded them that they could not arise. Yea, they are falling under my feet. Exactly what he was saying with his for what his father prophesied to him. This is what this verse was talking about, and this was what David was talking about here. David actually letting you know he was destroying his enemies. Second Samuel 40 and 41, this is the main one here. It says, for thou have girded me with the strength to battle. So we know now he had to fight. Them that roused up against me has thou subdued under me. So now that now they now they up under him. Thou has also given me the neck of my enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. So you see here how David is talking. It says, For the Lord has strengthened me to do what? To go into battle, to destroy them that hate him. The third part of this verse states his father's children, when we look back at the main scripture, that his father's children shall bow before him. Many people will follow that verse of the precepts of the mother children. When you look at Genesis 27, 29, I think I have that one. Yeah, Genesis 27, 29, but it's a key thing in here. It says, let people serve thee and nations bow before thee. Be Lord over thy brother and let thy mother's children bow, be, bow to thee. Cursed be to everyone that curses thee and blessed be to one, be, be, be he that blesses thee. Now, if you notice, it says thy mother's sons. But if you look back at Genesis 
40, 48, 49, and 8. Actually, we'll go to it. I'm on 9. Let's go. Okay, now if you look here, you see it says, Thy father's children. You see that? Thy father's children at forty at Genesis 49 and 8. But when you look at um, Genesis 40, uh, 27 and 9, it says, Thy mother's children. This is the precept that most people will run to. But this isn't the precept that you go to because this is saying thy mother's children. And this is the key why. If, it, if it's not stating thy mother's children, but thy father, notice how you look back at Genesis. How we, when we went back to Genesis 40, 49, and 8, Jacob said thy father's children referring to himself. Thy father's children shall, be, shall bow before thee. That's why he said that. Why he said it? Because they was mostly born of different wives. This is why that happened. This is why he said thy father's children. He didn't say thy mother's children. This is why he couldn't say that. Because if he would have said that, then he only would have been bowing to, the only one would have been bowing to him is the one that included Judah and his brothers that was born of the same mother as himself. Which that would have been only talking about the one that came from Rachel. This is why the problem with uh, with uh, Genesis 27 and 29 do not match the precept that a lot of people like to use. Because you have to remember, this is saying thy mother's sons shall bow before thee. But Jacob clears it and lets you know thy father's children. That's referring to the entire tribe, the, tw the, the entire 12 tribes. That's what this is saying right here, which is making that verse completely clear. But now we're going to go down. And we're going to look at the next part, which is uh, Genesis 40, uh, 49 and 9, to where this is the main part, which this is where the big issue is. It says, Judah is a lion whipped. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now, we're going to take a closer look at this verse, because... Many people have taught this verse, and many many taught this verse in a in a different way. But we're gonna, excuse me. But we're gonna look at this verse, and we're gonna see what this is saying here, because it's saying Judah is a lion whipped. Whip. What do they saying? Whip mean a cub, not beaten. This is the problem. But we're gonna break this down because it's saying. Judah is a lion whipped, lions whipped. And we're going to find out exactly what that is. We're going to break it down. We're going to look at Ezekiel. And we're going to go to Ezekiel 19. We're going to break some of this down. Then we're going to go down into it because we're going to find out that whip does it do not mean beaten, that he that he got beat up. That's not what this is saying. It's saying a lion whipped as in a cub. That's all it's saying. We're going to find this out. Now we're going to look at Ezekiel 19. We're going to go to 2 and 3. It says, And say, What is thy mother? A lioness. She lie down among lions. She lie down among lions. She nourish her whips. You see that? Among young lions. So she nourished her whips among young lions. And Verse 3, and she brought up one of her whips. It became a young lion. So the only way you can become a young lion is coming from a cub lion. And it says, and it learned to catch the prey and devour men. So you see this verse is not talking about actual animals. It's talking about men. See, because then after that, it devoured men. But the key verse in there we're looking at is the whips. So it says right here, she nourished her whips among young lions. That's what we have to notice. She nourished her cubs among young lions. If you notice, it doesn't say it, it don't it don't say cubs or baby, but it's let, letting you know her whips among young lions. So it's saying the same thing: her cubs among young lions. That's all this is saying. Now you're looking at the second part. And she brought up one of her cubs. It became a young lion. You see that? And she brought up 
one of her whips, it became a young lion. This is what's been going on the entire time. So long as we sit and we understand the scriptures to once we had to break it down sometime into little bites to where we can really get a hold on to it. Because as she brought her one of her cubs and then and she brought her one of her cubs to do what? She had to teach it. She had to teach it to do something. And that's this part right here. And it learned to catch the prey. And what it's talking about, it learned to destroy his enemies. This is all this is saying. This whip was a young lion who learned to devour his prey. He learned to destroy his prey. That's what this is saying here. Let's keep moving down. Can we have some more? We're gonna go. We're gonna go into our numbers and watch and watch how this part because we're looking at some of this part that's in here. And it says he crouched. He lay down as a lion and a great lion who should stare him up. Blessed be he that blessed thee and cursed he that curses thee. Now we're going to look right back. And if you go to your Bible and if you go to Genesis 49 and 9, we're going to look at some of that and watch how this, watch how this actually looks. And when you really look at it, in his fullness, 49 and 9, and you're going to see a lot of this. See, as I said, Judah is a whipped, is a lion's whip in his prey, and from the prey, which we see in here, but then it also tells you even more, he stooped down, he's crouched as a lion. And then right here in Numbers, is clearing it, making it, he's crouched and lay down as a lion. But what is it talking about? A prey to destroy men, his enemies. He will kneel, crouch like a lion. It is his nature as a lion, even having secured his pay, prey. And what he do? He kneel down and crouches. This is what it's talking about with David, who is what securing his prey, did not flee from the sight out of the fear of counterattack. So this is what he does. He will clomp down on him. And this is an actual symbol. This is the prey which he would do. Once he clamps down on him, he, he's crouched down, he is crouched down on him, on his prey. This is the part that you would look at. And he will not let them go until he has devoured them. This is what it's talking about. Numbers 24, 23 and 24. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion. So now it's telling you the people who David's people should rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lay down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. This is what 24, David crossed that line, prepared to attack at any time. See, but when you also look at this, when you look at the other part, it's talking about who should rouse him up. See, nobody wants to rouse him up. So this is where it clicks into Solomon, where it talks about that because it starts talking about some of his children. Because Solomon lays down as a lion, but no one thinks to rouse him up because they're thinking he's just like his father. Because David will destroy you. And we're going to look at some of this. And this is how David actually got his name. This is why most people don't understand why David actually became so powerful. We'll go to 2 Samuel 8, 13. 2 Samuel 8 and 13. And it says, And David got him a name when he returned from smiting the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being eight, 18,000 men, and put the garrison in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrison in all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whatsoever he wanted. See, this is what this is what the problem was. And David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all people. What was going on here? This is when David got his name. This is David was a young lion. So as a young lion, he went in, he went and he smit them. This is when they started giving David his respect. See, in the second part of that verse where it's talking about from the prey, meaning literally tearing 
But then when you look at uh, Genesis 37, 33, Jacob taught Joseph that he thought that Joseph was torn to pieces, even the evil beast devoured him. But that's what that's talking about on something else. But here we see in here where David didn't get his name until he started devouring people and those was his prey. That's why David killed everything around him. He dominated everything around him at all times. So when his son took over, his son had 40 years of peace. Why? Because David devoured all his enemies. Psalms 144, 1 and 2. It says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth, teaches me my hands to war and my fingers to fight. This is David. This is what he had learned. This is what he does. And he says, My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer, my shield, and whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. So when you look at the part of Genesis where he stoops down and he crouched like a lion, another David is crouched in order to be able to arouse himself at any moment when he attacked. So when anytime somebody gets ready to attack, he's always prepared. David was always prepared at all times. And he never really had to face enemy danger, so he was able to relax. Sin involved that these practically with these wars, the entire period of his reign, he always had to be ready at a moment's notice because he faced his enemies and he killed them. This is what David was about. David was a warrior. And David, anything that came up to anything that threatened him, David will destroy it around him. And his main thing was always to where they, they looked at, he was almost like fighting for survival, but David secured his throne with a strong hand. Numbers 24 and 9, it says, you know, right back, he crouched uh, and he lie down as a lion and a great lion, which he became, who shall stare him up? Now, once he became that great lion and his son took over, who gonna stir up his son? You don't, you don't know, you don't know if he's anywhere like his son. I mean, like his father. So you don't want to stir him up. That was that was this was that what this was talking about all the time. Verse uh, numbers twenty four and seventeen. It says, "And I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh, not close. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheath." So this is talking about also with David where it speaks where he smites his enemy in all nations coming from everywhere. This is what he's talking about. David will also break down their pride. This is what he was notorious for doing. When we go into Zechariah, you're going to look at Zechariah 10 uh, and we're going to get some there. And this is what this is talking about. It's uh, Zechariah 10 and we're going to look at 11. Zechariah 10, we're going to look at 11. It says, And he shall pass through the sea with affliction. And we're going to find out what each one of these means. And he and shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the deep in the rivers shall dry up, and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. Now, we're, when we're going to look back at this first part, it says, and he shall pass through the sea, with affliction is talking about the nations of people. And he should smite the waves of the sea. It's talking about all the nations. And now where it gets down, where you see where in all the depths of the river should dry up. He's talking about the peace that should happen. That's all this is saying. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at this. We're going to analyze it. We're going to see exactly what it's saying. Isaiah 48 and 18. Thou hast hearkened to my commandments, then they, peace be as a river. You see that? Peace be as a river. And thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Now you can also see the peace in another example in, in Isaiah 51, 15. But we see this here where he's talking about with the river. But this is talking about all the people which is in the sea. And this is, this is meaning all people. So most people always like to mix that up. But when you even go to the sea, and the reason why the Bible used the sea so much, 
when you go to the sea, look at all the different varieties of fish. He's talking about the same thing with nations. You know, I'm talking, you have so many different varieties of, of fish and, and mammals that is in this water. He's saying the same thing here. All different nations. Isaiah 15, 51 and 15, he said, But I am the Lord thy God that delivered the sea. You see here? Delivered the sea whose waves roared the Lord of hosts in his name. So it's just telling you all the nations of people, waves, nation, and the verse gives the name and the meaning back in Ezekiel 26 and 3. Here we go. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus. Now watch. I will cause many nations to come up against thee as the sea. You see that? Causes his waves to come up. Saying the same language, the exact same language. We have to always understand many times he would, he would mention trees, water, different things. And he's literally pertaining to people or nations, different ways. We have to always understand what, what the Most High is always portraying out. Ezekiel 21, 27. I will turn over, over, I mean, I mean, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until I come whose right it is, and I will give it him. So he will turn, overturn, overturn, overturn. He talking about kingdoms of power. And where we get that, we're going to see that in Haggai in, in 221. But, but watch how he see. So he's going to keep switching it out until he gets to the one. And it, we're going to look at Haggai 221. It says, speak to Zerubbabel, <coughs> the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and I will destroy the strength of king of the kingdoms and the heathens and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them and the horses and their riders shall come down every one by the sword of his brother. In that day saith the Lord of hosts I will take O Zerubbabel my servant the son of Shatel says the Lord, I will make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord. Now, if you just look at Sarah with Zerubbabel, you can also look in Matthew 1 and 1, I mean 1 and 12, and you see where it says Zerubbabel. So you see that this same person is actually in the Most High and is also in Jesus' lineage. So they're not using... The E and U, they're using O and O. So it's Z-O-R-O-B-A-L-B-A-B-L-E-L. Right now, it's being spelled Z-E-R-U. And it has two Bs. But it drops it down to one B when it gets into the New Testament. But it's talking about the same identical person. Now, all that was to say what? This is what Genesis 49 48 and 49 was speaking of. This was was it speaking of, but most people want to still sit there and say, this is what it was talking about. Now we have a very rare photo here that I put here, which um, it's kind of hard to get a hold to, but it, but I believe it might be out there, probably on the web, knowing anything might be on the web. But this is a rare photo of a slave ship that's in the mid 1800s, which. It has a picture of all the uh, have Israelites that's on the ship. Now, why am I showing it this way? The reason why, we want to see that Genesis is speaking of it based on in America. And how do we know in the images of the red picture, you think that it's divided the people by tribes. Now, we can see in here, if they divided the people, or this is how they brought them, when you look in um, the boat on how they stack them in the boat, and you see them out here when they let them out to move around, I guess, exercise the slaves, you can see right there, they're not going to be divided or no time that you ever see where, where they'll tell you they would divide these people by tribes. They never did. They would sit there and they would gather you all up together and you were sold together. So for them to sit there to say that 
they was a whip nation and, and who can rouse them. It was talking about a young cub. It was actually speaking of David. It was saying because what happened, he was going to be a young king. That is all this has been talking about the entire time. But people like to say that this is talking about something something different, and it's not. This is talking about something completely different than what they're using. So we have to we have to understand exactly what is happening all the time when when we when we dealing with something as as this nature. Because at no time did did this happen to where they will separate, you know, by tribes as slaves. All slaves, they just bunched them together. And all of them, they bunched together. Once they bumped them all together, they literally, they, they had to go through. And so you have some Judah, you have some Gad, you have some, some Benjamin, you have some Levi, you have some Simeon, you have some of everything that is here that is mixed together. And it makes no sense. So same as when you look right back at it. You can look right back at it. You know, this is this is actually, and that is actually a real slave picture. And you can see right there where they do not have no problem putting everybody together. But we will sit there and we have made signs and saying, you know, if you was here, you was, you was, uh, you you from the tribe of Judah just because you're from this location. How can you be from this location and saying you're from the tribe of Judah? Makes no sense because you all came over on the ship together. They didn't separate these ships. They didn't separate you by tribe. They put you all together and you were sold all together. So you have some people that is mixed that are everywhere. So to say that that, to say that, that chart is from the tribe of Judah that what they're saying there, that's that's not true. You have some of you now. You do have some people from Judah here, but you have some of Gad here. You have some of Benjamin here. You have some of Ephraim. You have some of everybody here. And that just lets you know we we was all mixed up because how we was mixed up because they didn't they did not take the time to separate you by tribe. And they was not going to separate you by tribe. Nowhere will you even find that in scripture. Nowhere will you even find that in a history book. So the reason that was made up, I don't know. But we're going to continue to check. And we're going to find out what the other ones are. But we know that whip do not mean being whipped as in beaten. We know a whip is talking about a young cub. And he grew up to be a young lion to which he had he was he started his kingdom and he was over his kingdom at a young man. That's all he's talking about. Not more than what you, you think it's saying, but most people like to sit and go into other other uh places and say, you know, he was a whip lion and who will rouse him up. No, you didn't want to rouse him up because he was prepared to attack. That's why he was crossed down. He was always prepared to attack. Always. That's all he's talking about. So it said, who will rouse him? You didn't want him to get roused up because he get roused up. What he was going to do? He was going to attack you. If you if David felt threatened, you were going to get attacked. That was a bottom line deal. So with that, I wish that you was uh, very richly blessed. And, and hopefully that as you go through the chart, most people can sit there and start getting rid of those charts because those charts really don't tell you who you are. You know, they, they we for us to know exactly what tribe we're from, that that that's something that the most high would have to actually give you the discernment and probably we had to go through bloodlines to even find out. But we won't find that out until the other side to where we'll we be we'll be depicted to where we're gonna find out what gate we're gonna be going through. So until then, that's something for the most high to be doing, not for us to be doing because we was all mixed up. That's why he said we will be as the sands of the sea. In no way possible right now we can figure out who exactly we are. We don't know if we're from the tribe of Judah or from the tribe of Benjamin or from the tribe of Levi or Simeon or any other one. We don't know what tribe we're actually from right now. All we know we are some of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So with that, I bid each and every person a shalom.